into a butterfly. Would he start shedding some of those legs and sprouting wings or something like that? Well, of course he couldn't survive under such circumstances. Furthermore, how could evolution program a mass of jelly to produce a butterfly? It's impossible to imagine how such a process could take place. It's silly to even think about it. You see, everything is programmed in that egg. The moment that egg is conceived, the program to produce that caterpillar and then to convert that caterpillar into a mass of jelly and to program that mass of jelly to become a butterfly is all right there from the start. Now, I would like Dr. Plamer, I would like anybody, any evolutionist, to explain how that could have taken place. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, it takes place through a series of genetic mistakes because these mutations, which supposedly convert a little single cell organism into you and I, in the course of its development and reproduction, began to make mistakes. We call them mutations. Now, the evolutionists admit it. Almost all of those mutations are bad and produce all kinds of horrible things. We have hundreds and hundreds of genetic diseases produced by these mutations. And as a matter of fact, I do not know, I've never been convinced there's ever been one single good mutation. But let us suppose that almost all are bad, but once in a while one is good. Then you have to have this struggle for existence, and the good mutant replaces the original. Remember, the, the original was already highly adapted, he was highly uh, prepared, or he never would have arisen, you see. And so there's not much of an advantage, just a slight advantage. You have to have all this struggle for existence and so forth, and you have to have millions and millions of these DNA accidents or mistakes to convert man into, uh, to, to convert a single cell organism into man. Never happened in five billion years. It wouldn't happen in 500 billion years. And certainly it's not going to convert a caterpillar into a butterfly. It's not going to tell a master jelly how to program itself into a butterfly. If anybody knows that, I'd be very happy to hear it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me just conclude by saying this. All I'm asking you to do is weigh all of the evidence on each side. And then decide for yourself which model of origins, creation or evolution, do the data fit best. In my scientific studies, I have become convinced the best statement we can say about our origins today is still, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I thank you very, very much. Creationism requires catastrophic events. 
as we heard in the chamber, and we had to have some catastrophe to get these from. I want to investigate the implications of creationist science. I want to look at their publications. I want to look at how they communicate and teach their science. And I want to look at how they get their data. Let's first look at catastrophic events. One of the major arguments used is the Great Flood. The bulk of this, co this continent, this earth, sediments and fossils, we hear form in the Great Flood. And we have a split in their science there. One arm says we had continental drifting and the other arm says we haven't. So to be fair, we'll look at both possibilities. Continental drifting is where we show that the continents have pulled apart and have moved and have collided. This is a massive process. If we had continental drifting immediately after the Great Flood, then our continents would have been moving at four kilometres a year. Now, has any mariner recorded continents moving at four kilometres a year? Yet our creationists want this to have happened every year for the last 4,000 years. Why did Columbus go in 1492? If he went 500 years earlier, it would have been 2,000 kilometres closer. <laughs> that is the level of their science that they expect us to believe. If we have the continents pulling apart at that rate, immediately after the Great Flood, and this is the theory of one of the doyens of the creationists, We'll come back to him later. This is his magnificent theory. Then we would have had uplift of mountain ranges of more than a metre per year every year for the last 4,000 years. Was that ever recorded in the Atlas Mountains? In the Alps? In the Andes? Has anyone seen mountains go up a metre a year? No. But that's the sort of science they want to teach us. When we pull apart the crust, we have enormous catastrophic processes which take place. We have earthquakes, we have volcanoes, and we have tidal waters. If we pulled apart our continents in the last 4,000 years, that since the Great Flood, we would have had an earthquake, catastrophic earthquake, much greater than the one that hit Tokyo yesterday, a catastrophic earthquake every six minutes for the last 4,000 years. Never happened. We would have had a catastrophic volcano every 12 minutes. So much dust thrown in the atmosphere that the atmosphere would have been cool because it would have been perpetually dark. We would have had a nuclear winter for the last 4,000 years since the Great Flood, if we believe this sort of science. The cooling of new volcanic rock requires circulating seawater. We have Using these calculations, 270 cubic kilometres of new volcanic rock that must have come out of every one of the Earth's 500 volcanoes every year, every volcano for the last 4,000 years would have thrown out 270 cubic kilometres of rock. We haven't seen it, but we've got to cool all that rock. If we cool it with seawater, our seawater temperature becomes above 100 degrees Celsius. We also have a massive process from our volcanicity and our earthquakes giving us tidal away. So we have an earthquake every six minutes, a major volcanic process every 12 minutes covering the earth with gases and dust, and every 18 minutes a tidal away. Now the simple question is, if this has happened every six minutes, 12 minutes and 18 minutes over the last 4,000 years, why wasn't it recorded in history? <laughs> we have a continuous record of history. That's the sort of science I want to believe. Now, the only possible answer I can give you is that how can you write history when every six minutes your desk wobbles, it's permanently dark, and you get hit with a tidal wave of boiling water every 18 minutes? Okay, 
let's look at the other possibility, that we haven't had continental drift when we've had this great catastrophic flood, where we've had a sudden burial. If we're going to have a great flood, as a scientist, you ask the question, where does the water come from? We have had 4.4 billion cubic kilometers of water to cover this earth in a great flood. Where does that water come from? If it comes from the atmosphere, from the vapor canopy, then that requires atmospheric pressure to be 840 times greater than today. That requires the atmosphere to have 99.9% .9 water vapor and 0.02% oxygen. Not really an ideal pre-cruise atmosphere, is it? To condense that water into rain would require a raising of atmospheric temperature to 3,500 degrees Celsius. So it's quite clear 